Hi guys, my name's Gabs and today we're going to be looking at a poem by Christina Rossetti called Remember. Now this is a poem from the A-level syllabus from the Love Through the Ages poetry collection but it also might appear on some GCSE papers too. So first we're going to look at Christina Rossetti's life, we'll do a bit of historical context, we'll read the poem, then we're going to do a deep dive into form and structure and then we'll have some lighter analysis, lighter than usual anyway. So let's look at who Christina Rossetti was. Christina Rossetti was born in 1830 to a wealthy family in London. Her father, Gabriele Rossetti, was a poet and political exile from Italy. Her mother, Frances Polidori, was an incredible woman who devoted her life to educating her children. Christina had two brothers and one sister. Her brother Dante was an artist and painter, while William and Maria became writers. Christina was brought up as a pious Anglican, so most of her poems focus on love and devotion. For instance, she wrote the words to the notorious Christmas carol in the bleak midwinter, and she also wrote children's poetry. Remember was written by Christina Rossetti when she was still a teenager at the tender age of 19. Now, it was written in the year 1849, but it wasn't actually published until 1862 in Rossetti's first volume of poems, Goblin Market and Other Poems. Remember is a classic Victorian poem where the speaker reflects on how she would expect or like her lover to feel once she's passed away. Now the poem uses relatively simple language, so I'm going to ask you to focus on form and structure. And the question I'm going to ask you is, where does the speaker change her mind? That is the question I'm throwing at you and we will answer it towards the end. Let's move on to some historical context. Remember was written in the Victorian era, which was known for its high death rate and its cult of mourning. Queen Victoria mourned her husband, Prince Albert, by dressing in black and laying out his clothes and medicine every day for 40 years. His death created this appetite for grief. In fact, Prince Albert died the year before Rossetti wrote Remember. For Victorians, there were strict rules on grieving etiquette, what you wore, what you did or did not do, and how you communicated the news of death. So as we read the poem, think about how Rossetti communicates death. Is it soft and tender, or is it hard and cruel? And also, remember to focus on form and structure more than anything else. So without further ado, let's read the poem. Remember me when I'm gone away, gone far away into the silent land, when you can no more hold me by the hand, nor I half turn to go, yet turning stay. Remember me when no more day by day you tell me of our future that you'd planned. Only remember me, you understand, it will be late to counsel then or pray. Yet, if you should forget me for a while, and afterwards remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that once I had, better by far you should forget and smile, than that you should remember and be sad. So emotions that come up for me are ones of comfort and tenderness intimacy. But why was Rossetti as a 19-year-old writing such a morose poem? Death dominated the lives of the Victorians because they didn't have the healthcare systems that they have today and life was so much more fragile so it's no surprise that death was never far from the Victorian mind. Now we're going to look at some form and structure. Remember is a Petrarchan sonnet or Italian sonnet. And I've put together a little Petrarchan sonnet checklist for you so you can't go wrong. Here's the list. So a Petrarchan sonnet is named after a 14th century Italian poet, Francesco Petrarca. The first eight lines are called an octave. The last six lines are called a sestet. 
A volta divides these two parts, so a volta is a turning point in the poem. Typically, a volta comes at the end of line eight and the beginning of line nine, or the end of the octave and the beginning of the sestet. Iambic pentameter is the heartbeat rhythm, so it's a weak syllable followed by a strong syllable. Remember me when I am gone away. That dee-dum, 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 dee-dum. That is iambic pentameter. Then we have um, another element of the octave, which an octave introduces a problem or desire, and then the sestet provides the resolution to those problems or desires. Usually a Petrarca's sonnet has a flexible rhyme scheme, so the octave is kind of rigid, it's more ABBA, and then the sestet kind of does its own thing. So now we know the traits of a Petrarchan sonnet, let's see how many of these, this criteria is fulfilled in Christina's Remember poem. So as you can see, the octave goes to the lines, it will be late to counsel then or pray. And yes, it does follow the A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A rhyme. Away, land, hand, stay. Day, planned, understand, pray. So that's clear enough. Let's look at the second part of the poem, the sestet. C, D, D, E, C, E. While, grieve, leave, had, smile, sad. So it kind of does its own thing. There's definitely a strong rhyme scheme happening here and she has been very intentional with the rhyme scheme. Now, where is the Volta? It will be late to counsel then or pray, yet if you should forget me for a while, there's your Volta. So this is where the speaker changes her tone. Now we'll discuss why she does this at the very end. So stick with the video and your questions will be answered. Let's look at some deeper analysis then. So we have a refrain. Now a refrain is just a repeated phrase and the repeated phrase here is remember me. Clearly she is so insistent on the remember me refrain because she fears that her lover will forget her once she's passed away. The poem is written in first person narrative, which means the poet is speaking from an I perspective. And then we have some euphemisms. So what is a euphemism? Um, basically a, a turn of phrase that is more tactful and sensitive. It kind of doesn't name the thing that is happening. So instead of saying, um, so-and-so has died, it's they've passed away or they're no longer with us. So the euphemisms that Rossetti uses here are phrases like gone away or silent land or no more hold me by the hand. They're all tempered with sorrow, but it's softened and it's tender. It's comforting to read despite the harrowing reality of death. Then we have some juxtaposition in the lines, nor I half turn to go yet turning stay. She turns to go, but she stays. That's your juxtaposition there, two sort of contrasting um, desires it shows her reluctance or her hesitance to leave the world. She's not completely reconciled to death. Part of her wants to stay in the land of the living. Then we have in the Volta area, it says, yet if you should forget me for a while and afterwards remember, do not grieve. So this theme of grief, you know, she's saying don't feel guilt because once you surface through that sea of grief, I want you to be happy. She mentions darkness and the corruption that he will go through in his grief. Now, darkness obviously has is, is symbolic of sorrow, pain, suffering. And corruption is interesting because the present uh, day meaning of corruption is something or someone's been dishonest. But actually the archaic version of corruption is to do with something decaying or rotting away or being infected. So she sees grief or she's presenting grief as though it's this kind of thing that infects the person. 
So it can be interpreted in two ways. She could be talking about the darkness and the corruption that the lover goes through after her death, or it could be um, Rossetti's own darkness and corruption of, you should remember me after I die. I don't want you to be happy or move on in any way because I am the one love in your life and you should go on mourning me forever like Queen Victoria did for Prince Albert. But here she takes a really radical standpoint and she is selfless enough to say quite honestly to her lover, you know, I would much prefer you to move on and be happy. And I am more likely to believe that it's um, the second interpretation, because if you look, for if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of thoughts that once I had, you know, so she's talking about the vestige. So that's uh, a trace or remnant of something that's, that's kind of disappearing or no longer exists. So remember, this poem is a... Um, it develops, it, it presents a problem, the problem of her dying and how she thinks a lover should feel about her death, um, that he should mourn forever. But slowly, slowly, as she writes the poem, it's like she comes to a fairer understanding of how she should actually think about it. The darkness and corruption, she sees how she used to feel as a darkness and corruption. I shouldn't, I shouldn't expect my lover to mourn for me forever. That's not right. The vestige and the darkness and corruption are those thoughts. And now those thoughts in the sesta have become a trace, a vestige. And she thinks differently about it now. So remember the question I asked at the beginning, where does the poet change her mind? You've probably worked it out by now because it's quite obvious, but it's the Volta. So that is where she changes her mind. And then we have the last two lines. Better by far you should forget and smile than that you should remember and be sad. So by the end of the poem, the original remember refrain has taken on a different meaning. In the octave, she was asking for her lover to remember her because she had a fear of being forgotten. But when we hit the Volta, she changes her mind completely. She wants him to remember to be happy in spite of her death. Hmm. There's something very humble about her selflessness. You know, she loves her partner so much that she wishes him to go on and potentially have another lover. This acceptance would have been a radical point of view for the time. And I can imagine it was quite freeing for a lot of people who um, felt the same as Rossetti, but were too hesitant to say otherwise or too hesitant to go against the grain. And the fact that this poem is written as a sonnet, it serves to bolster the argument that this is this is really like permission from the speaker to her lover to say go on and be happy um, she really makes peace with their relationship in the form of a sonnet so there's something really beautiful and poetic about that so guys that's the end of the poetry analysis for remember if you have anything else to add pop it in the comments below don't forget to like this video and subscribe. If you want to hang out between lessons, come and say hi on Instagram. And if you want to get your hands on this deck with some juicy notes, head to my Patreon. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.